So what I want to do today is spend the next 30 minutes or so to explore this idea about getting the blend right. And I, I want to think about this through this challenge of how do we engage learners in this space. At, at, at the University of Greenwich, I work within a centralised learning and teaching unit. And over the last six months, lots of colleagues have been exploring student engagement with me in this blended learning space. But as they have got underway with this new academic year, colleagues are now coming to me and saying, OK, I've taken a blended learning approach to my module. I've set up a discussion forum for my students and they're not talking. Or I'm running these live synchronous seminars and tutorials, but my students aren't saying anything. So people are looking to, well, what can we do to maximise student engagement or just encourage students to engage in the space in the way we anticipate? And in many cases, colleagues are looking to me for perhaps facilitation approaches or activities that I know might work in this blended context. Um, now, I'm going to start today. I may disappoint in saying that, in my view, there is no silver bullet. There, there is no perfect activity that will work across every group. There is no perfect facilitation approach that will definitely ensure your students participate in the way you intend. However, I do think the key to getting the blend right is thinking about both what we are doing at the facilitation and scaffolding stage of learning, but perhaps more importantly, what are we doing at that design stage? What is our role in designing in a way that really maximises learning? And also um, that we're really focused on purpose of the different learning activities. And we're really focused on how social, relational, affective, these human aspects of learning and these human aspects of connection may support engagement in the blended context. So this led me to thinking that there are three key themes that I'd like us to focus on today. These are about coherence, connection and care. Um, and I'll be implicitly pointing to these throughout the session, sometimes more explicitly, and I'd like to come back to them at the end of, this, of the session today. And I want to structure the, the next half an hour or so in thinking about, first of all, let's take a step back. Lots of us have been teaching online now for, um, or teaching in that blended context for a few weeks. Um, let's take a step back and think about what do we actually do in blended learning? What are the promises of bl blended learning? And what, what does this look like maybe in practice or if we take a pragmatic approach? Moving from that, I want to think what is our role as teachers in cultivating this blend? Um, how, how are, what is our role in maximising students' learning? And then ultimately moving towards some examples about how we motivate, inspire, engage our students, which ultimately, ultimately relates to this third of my broad themes of care. Care is so important in this context. So the context um, of COVID-19 has certainly accelerated the legitimacy of the adoption of um, digital tools and platforms for learning and digital spaces indeed for learning in that context of creating a blended learning approach um, within our different institutional contexts. And the literature does point to these um, benefits of blended learning. I sometimes call these the promises of blended learning. And you'll see this quote by Stein and Graham on the slide, which points to one of the benefits as being around flexibility um, of access, that students that perhaps can exert more autonomy um, in terms of when they are accessing their studies, where they are accessing their studies. Also that these blended um, delivery can per perhaps provide clearer organisation of studies um, and it can support more active learning, self-directed learning, autonomous learning. These are all um, phrases that we hear associated with the promises of blended learning. But the second part of this quote also points to blended courses tap into the socially networked aspects of our modern lives. So that idea that we are um, 
living in this digital context, we are living in these blurred spaces and that actually blended learning provides this opportunity to extend learning beyond the classroom. So that's the promise of blended learning. Sounds promising, sounds like this has the potential to transform maybe somewhat traditional approaches to teaching and learning for those of us who are more used to working in campus based universities. But I want to take a step back this morning and think about what do we really mean by the term blended learning? Now focus first of all on the pumpkins. Halloween is coming in the UK. Lots of us will have have pumpkins and we can all agree, hopefully by looking at this picture, that these are pumpkins, but there's diversity in there. They are green pumpkins. If you have never seen a green pumpkin, you may realise, you may not realise what it is, you may not know what it's for, you may not know what you can do with it. So what is the connection between these pumpkins and blended learning? I hear you ask. Well, blended learning is a term that has always suffered, in my view, from it can be quite a broad, all encompassing term, but at the same time, people use the, the term blended learning to also refer to some very specific models of blended learning. We see this more in the literature from the United States about rotational models of blended learning, lab based debates over whether flipped classroom is a model of blended learning or not. So we have this quite broad use of the term blended learning. Um, but also some really specific and precise um, uses of that term. So what this means is that um, when we use the term blended learning, we cannot assume that we as educators across different institutional contexts are talking about the same thing. Um, and if this inconsistency exists for us as staff, of course, this misconception, misunderstanding might also exist for our students. Indeed, learning may be something that's quite foreign to them. They might not know that a green pumpkin ever existed. So we play a role as educators in making and being explicit about what we mean by blended learning and articulating that to our students, making the learning system, the blended learning system make sense. And on the right hand side of this slide, what we have is a more recent definition of blended learning offered by JISC. Um, it's not dissimilar to um, the, the Quality Assurance Agency also issued a taxonomy for digital learning. I would really recommend looking at that if you're fairly new to this area, just in terms of some of the language we're using and what we really mean by, by blended learning. This quote look, um, defines blended learning as the combination of face-to-face -face learning and dynamic digital activities and content that facilitate any time, any place learning. So key there is the face to face and the digital, thinking about activities and content and thinking about that, uh, that flexibility in terms of where learners are able to access their learning. So we have this definition of blended learning and we're thinking about the combination of activities and how we as educators combine these, how we make decisions about which activities, which type of content, how we deliver it. But what I found in the context of COVID, certainly from the spring through the summer in the UK context, we had this focus on um, how can we deliver um, our learning, adopting digital tools. There was this real focus on technology and on tools. I understand this in the University of Greenwich at the start of um, the, the sort of COVID and the UK lockdown, we did not have one um, institutional license and an agreed platform through which staff could deliver synchronous live teaching sessions. So our institution has made this Herculean shift in introducing Microsoft Teams for use with students and for use in live synchronous teaching. So I understand the focus on technology and on digital skills, but the risk with this focus on technology and the functionality of technology is that it takes us away from that where our focus, in my view, really should be, which is on the pedagogy. So frequently staff were coming to me and saying, how can I use this software or this technology with my students? How do I um, get them to engage online? How do I get them to interact? And I always have to say, take a step back. 
think about why are we using this technology? So moving from the how to the why. Um, I understand that as people are seeking to move their learning into a blended, um, they're teaching into a blended learning um, context, there's a desire by some um, colleagues to replicate what they do face to face in that on, online and blended context. Um, I would definitely say your focus should not be seeking to replicate as much as that feels comfortable to us. I push you to think, is this a chance to actually transform and reconstruct um, the way that we approach our teaching? So one example of that is around the issue of lectures. At the University of Greenwich, um, staff looked at how do we make this shift into a blended context to allow all students to access their studies. I want to move my face-to-face, hour-long lectures into live, synchronous, online lectures. But again, the context here is so significant. If we have very minimal opportunities to meet our students synchronously, whether that's face to face or whether that's online, if these uh, this ability to meet our students is much more limited, I would say why use that time to deliver content or deliver quite didactic teaching? Actually, I would encourage you to think about um, how can you use that space for students to apply their learning, to discuss their learning, to build connections with peers. Um, so again, with the lectures, that's a quite a good example. You're not trying to replicate. You might want to think about what you might do differently. So what we do at Greenwich is all of our lectures should be pre-recorded, but then for colleagues it became well, I'll record an hour long lecture because I'm used to lecturing for an hour in one go. But actually there are pedagogical and accessibility reasons for chunking your lectures into smaller bite size, 10, 15 minute recordings. This is much more effective in terms of student engagement than delivering longer lectures. Now there's no right or wrong way, but I'm just getting you to think about are you seeking to reconstruct your learning in this new environment or are you simply looking to replicate using digital technology? And that leads me into this next point about the absence of coherence and purpose. We've become so focused for, for many of us, and I understand why we're trying to develop our digital skills, but we are so focused on the technology that what can happen is we have our blended learning system isn't coherent. So we have these different um, learning episodes that maybe isolation. You have your live sessions over here. You have you want students to do some asynchronous activities over there. You're maybe using a Padlet or a third party app for something else. These will sit as disconnected. They will not complement and reinforce each other. And for students, they can also appear in competition to each other. They need to know what they should be studying and when. Is the order in which they study important? Um, are, are some elements mandatory? Are some elements optional? We need to guide our students. We need to make meaning and coherence of all these um, aspects of learning and bring them together. I see them um, with a colleague. We, we develop the metaphor of the cogs. So we see these different cogs within our blended learning system and they sit separately unless we bring them together and make this coherent for our students, making the purpose coherent and making the learning explicit. And the next th the next issue with this focus on technology um, can mean overlooking context and the importance of connection. Garrison, Anderson and Archer's Community of Inquiry Framework, some of you will be familiar with this, about um, sort of student learning and interaction online. This framework reminds us of the importance of what they call social presence. The, the ways in which people almost form their online identity, how they relate to their peers and engage with others in their learning community, how they develop these interpersonal relationships. These are all really key in supporting what they identify as cognitive presence. If we don't have that social presence, students will then experience perhaps challenges around cognitive presence, which is where they make meaning 
where they form their no and construct their knowledge um, through discourse with others and things like that. So we need that social presence to enable that cognitive presence. But this is also so much more important in the context of COVID. Um, we know due to social distancing, our students are at risk of isolation, feeling disconnected from peers, disconnected from their tutor. Um, there was a, a GISC um, in the UK, the GISC Student Digital Experience Survey, surveyed 20,000 higher education students in the UK. And this issue of seeking interaction and opportunities to collaborate, this was absolutely key, a key finding of that survey. We found that locally at Greenwich, our, our students' union did a survey of student experiences of COVID-19. And again, this theme of students are seeking connection and interaction through their learning. So we need to look at, at this theme of connection, connecting students with each other. So when focusing, I've thought about how we've maybe focused in the context of COVID and trying to get everything ready for the start of this academic year. We've maybe focused on that technology, um, but we need to think about these three questions. I'd like you to ask yourself these three questions when you leave the session today. For what purpose have you introduced digital technology? To what extent have you considered the combination of activities and content as part of this coherent blended learning approach? And have you made that overt and explicit to your students? And then what does this mean relative to your pedagogy? Now, in some ways, these questions are the wrong way around. We should be starting with our pedagogy and what are we trying to achieve? And that leads me into thinking about our role as teachers. Um, and here I wanted to refer to Diana Lorillard, um, who sees pedagogy as the act of guiding learning and that our role as teachers as is as one of being a travel guide. I really like this, this kind of metaphor and this idea. I think it aligns well with our ambitions um, in terms of the promises of blended learning. We want to create this really active, collaborative learning environment where the students are being more self-directed um, so I like this idea that we are there as a guide. This very much builds on the idea that some of us will be familiar with from um, Alison King, um, who, who was reflecting on constructivist approaches to learning. And she um, coined that phrase, um, moving from sage on the stage to guide on the site. And it really, as educators, we should be thinking about this, this emphasis on our role as being one of guidance facilitation. So we're supporting students to engage with course content, to engage with maybe information we provide them and to construct knowledge. That's where the, the sort of learning is happening when they're constructing knowledge in meaningful ways. And that is our role as a guide in that process. So when thinking a bit more about the role um, of or our role as teachers, um, I thought, well, ultimately, where is our area of focus? And I think, again, returning to some of the themes I mentioned right at the start of the session today, we're thinking about designing learning and how we structure learning. Again, thinking about making decisions around activities or content, but also how we signpost that quite explicitly to our students. Um, I've, um, over the past few weeks, in conversations with colleagues, there are, there are some of my colleagues are doing fantastic things. They've created these really interesting, engaging, um, blended um, contexts within their modules. But if they've not articulated their rationale to students who are completely new to this way of learning, who are unsure of when they should be engaging and what they should be doing, we need to be more explicit in how we um, articulate that to our students and how we signpost what they should be doing when. Part of that signposting, I think particularly towards the start of a module, is about establishing a rhythm, um, so about some consistency. So you may say to your students, each week I want you to do four things and keep that consistent. Um, what they're doing within that may change, but they know I've got one, two, three, four things that I need to do. 
You might decide that every Monday you email them um, with a prompt email that says, OK, this is what I want you to work on this week or this is to start this week. The students then become used to receiving that prompt email every Monday. You're getting them into a rhythm in terms of how they should engage. So that's part of signposting. And scaffolding and facilitation, how we scaffold that learning and what our role is in, in that. Um, again, like this is absolutely key in this blended learning environment. And even when our students are doing asynchronous activities where we are not there, we should still be thinking about what our role is when they are doing these asynchronous activities. Are we stepping back? Are we involved? Are we moderating? Are we weaving together students' contributions? Are we summarising the group's contributions as a whole? We really need to think about our role in that scaffolding. So these questions should guide us. What type of learning do I want my students ultimately to be achieving? So these are the, when we're thinking about what activities or how we want to design our learning, ultimately what type of learning are, do we want our students to achieve? That then leads us to identify Okay, well, what types of activities might support that type of learning? What space should it happen in, physical or digital? And linked to that, is this something that can be done asynchronously with students working at different times um, but being connected perhaps to their virtual learning environment? Or is it something that needs to be done synchronously? The real time live element and exchange of ideas is actually critical for that type of learning to take place. And then the final kind of prompt there, thinking about your role, as I said, before an activity, during an activity and after. So before how you design, plan, establish really clear instructions, during, again, what is our role in terms of the facilitation? And then after, are we providing formative feedback? Is this at a group level? Is it at an individual level? Um, and how do we consolidate learning for our students? So when thinking about this idea of the type of learning, I wanted to introduce um, very briefly, people will likely be familiar with Diana Lorillard's um, conversational framework, but, but also the um, ABC learning design workshops. These were designed within University College London. You can look this up online. Um, this is an approach to, to um, sort of learning design and um, learning and teaching centres like myself will run workshops informed by this ABC learning design approach. And the reason I wanted to signpost it is because um, Laura Lard identifies these um, six learning types. And I think these are quite useful when thinking about what is it I'm trying to achieve with my students. I'm not going to go through each of these in turn, and there will be people here who are very familiar with this approach. But I just thought it was useful to point to some examples thinking about learning types. And I'm going to start with acquisition. Um, acquisition for, for Laura Lard is, is a, that type of learning very much. Some of us will relate that to content and delivery of content. In the face to face environment that may have been through lecturing or demonstration in class. So what might that mean in the blended context? Well, we may not um, want to use those live sessions for delivery of more content and therefore we might want to pre record sessions or we might want to curate content. There might be existing content and um, open source content online that we can curate. So instead of providing a lecture that we provide, actually what we've done is curated content, curated short bite sized lectures. I work um, with an academic in, in science and she decided she was getting rid of her lectures. She was introducing Moodle lessons where you can bring together content and activities for students to test their learning and receive feedback on their learning. Um, really, really interesting approach to lectures and she wanted each student to complete the Moodle lesson before attending their class. But she then ran a poll with her students and asked them, well, how do you find um, this new approach to blended learning? And some students loved it. They said they found the material really engaging. Um, they liked that they could get some formative feedback before coming to the class, but there was also a group of students who were really confused. 
who were frustrated, who um, didn't like the fact that there were no lectures. They were like, where are the lectures? We don't understand. So there's something there around. We can be really creative in how we're designing this blended environment, but we need to how we make meaning of this and how our students make meaning of this may be different. So how do we bring these together to reach a shared interpretation of what we're trying to do and what the benefits may be for students in terms of engagement? So again, returning to the idea of signposting is really important. In terms of um, another of the, the learning types that it is signposted is in terms of discussion. Where do students have those opportunities to exchange ideas, to challenge each other? Um, possibly in the face to face traditional environment, we may have an in class discussion of a case study. You might teach um, something related to perhaps health and safety and you're using a case study that you discuss with your students. So in the blended context, is that something we could put um, or design as an online discussion forum activity? Now, online discussion forums can be brilliant and they can be utterly frustrating, particularly when you invest so much in, in designing these online forums and then students potentially are not engaging. Um, my key thing here is particularly towards the start of a module, if you're introducing online discussion forums, make it clear what the benefits are to the students in terms of engagement, how it fits in terms of their um, live sessions that they might be joining, but also provide really clear instructions. Um, you cannot be explicit enough with these um, online forums. So I'm going to give you an example that I've seen in terms of um, the history lesson. So your students might typically discuss um, the origins of the First World War and you might put a post on the forum and say, OK, we've been learning about the origins of the First World War. What do you think? This is far too open. It's far too ill defined and um, we need to really scaffold and support the engagement with that type of activity. So a suggestion I would say is give the students something visual to discuss. Could you give them an historical source and put that in the forum? Could you provide them with a question? So instead of just some general, what do you think? You're providing a really specific question and potentially some prompts in terms of how they can engage with that question. You might also want to be really precise in terms of when you want the activity to be completed. Is there a word count? Do they need to provide academic references? Be very, very explicit in your instructions for these online forum activities. This extends also to if you want the students to engage with peers in an online discussion forum. They are new to this. They may not necessarily know how to engage with peers, how to provide feedback. So I would say again, you might want to say, um, read the comments of at least three of your peers and respond to one. When responding to your peer, you may want to think about X, Y and Z. So again, you're really supporting that engagement. I also want you to think with online discussion forums about what your role is. Um, if you have a large module and you open up discussion forums, is your role going to be responding to every single post? Can the students expect formative feedback from their tutor? Or actually, are you saying to them the benefit is you will receive feedback from your peers and then I will provide group level feedback at the end of the task, teasing out some key points and their relevance to your summative essay due at the end of term. So make your role explicit to the students and that's also making the potential benefits to the students overt and explicit as well in terms of well why should I engage with this forum activity you've indicated what they can benefit from in terms of engagement. One other um, area that I want to point to um, in terms of these this idea of learning types and what that might mean in the blended context is um, that theme of that, that learning type sorry of production and that's when we're enabling learners to consolidate their learning by articulating their understanding and practice. This might typically be done, for example, you might have a presentation in class and 
at the University of Greenwich, I've had some colleagues come to me recently and they say, OK, well, how do I enable my students in Microsoft Teams to present? Um, I have groups of students presenting. But again, I'm asking them in the context of COVID, do you want to use that online live synchronous session for the presentation of content? Or could that be done, even if that's led by the students, could, could that be done um, asynchronously? Could the students pre-record a presentation in Teams, sharing that with their peers before the session? And then you ask every single student to watch at least one other presentation or a certain number of presentations and come prepared with one question for each group or for each presentation. So you're, you're complementing there what the students are doing asynchronously before the class with what they are doing live synchronously in the session. And it also means in the live session, the students are really focused again on applying learning, engaging with each other, um, some of those relational aspects of learning and teaching, uh, potentially challenging each other. So you're changing how you're using that live session. So I've just wanted to point to some of the learning types and thinking about the purpose in terms of what we're trying to achieve and what that might mean in terms of how we design, deliver and facilitate learning in this blended context. So in this kind of final, um, part of the, the presentation. I just want to return to some of these ideas again around everything I've spoken about so far in terms of really thinking about purpose, really thinking about the design, thinking about our role, all of these and taking the time to explore all of these will maximise student engagement because ultimately it's about making the purpose and relevance clear to us and to students. It's about connecting different elements within the blended context because that will support engagement. And one of the, the pitfalls with some blended learning approaches is this idea of what people call a course and a half. And it's when you have some really enthusiastic um, academics who have their live synchronous sessions and then loads of asynchronous activities and then their students don't engage and it's a bit overwhelming. Um, we need to think about how the different components connect to each other. And if you have added an asynchronous learning activity and it's, you've got a really clear purpose, what have you taken away from somewhere else? Like, have you thought about um, the, the number of hours that your students should be spending on the module and thinking about that as you're thinking about the, the amount of independent study and directed study that your students are undertaking when you're planning your blended learning and when you are connecting the learning. But the, the final kind of couple of points in this slide um, relate to that point about, so we've thought a bit about coherence and connection. It's also about connecting individuals and that idea of social presence. Again, I'm returning to that idea in the community of inquiry framework, that idea about social presence is so fundamental in this blended space. But one of the key things about this context is students did not um, choose to learn in this way. Um, they, it's new to them. So there's a really important step in terms of socialising our students into how they can learn online, what are appropriate ways of communicating with others, how can they build a respectful and supportive learning community. We need to explore that explicitly with our students. We cannot assume that they know how to do this. So that process of socialisation is really important. And even if um, I think it's also recognising that towards the start of a module, we can't expect this instantaneous students will be really vibrant and engaged online. We need to support them in how to engage, building these relationships as part of a learning community and then building on that over time. And as that builds, you will probably find that your role as the tutor, you can step back slightly. You can perhaps be less direct in terms of your instruction and your facilitation. And this led me just to, I just want to signpost this, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, 
if you haven't looked at this already and you're interested in this idea of initially motivating students and getting them into the online space, then that process of socialisation and engaging with others, then we look at sort of integrating um, learning activities that are more related to the module content. I would definitely recommend you look at Jilly Salmon's work um, and her five stage module uh, model. She has a really good website that you can have a look at and her the focus here is very much less on this obsession that we can have with content and really taking the time to think about how we build participation incrementally and with really structured activities. It's also about building the students skills, their digital skills, how they um, their digital learning literacies, but also how we build their confidence. And um, so I, that's definitely worth having a look at if um, you're not familiar um, with this um, model. Just to finish up, um, what, what are the key things around getting the blend right? Um, as I've emphasised several times, I think it's really focusing on what you're trying to achieve, what type of learning are you trying to achieve that focus on pedagogy is absolutely key. But even with with that focus on pedagogy, how is the blended learning as a coherent learning system? How is it coherent to both us and to our students? Um, some of the great examples of practice I've seen amongst colleagues at Greenwich so far are around asking our students I would say you know your students best. You know the cultural context in which they're joining their studies. Um, you, you, you know from previous experience about how they may respond to things. However, I would say this context is challenging and it is worthwhile um, reaching out to our students, indicating that we want to work in partnership with them. We are learning how to teach in this new context. They are learning how to learn in this new context. Um, there's something that's quite important in this um, this environment that we're working in at the moment. It kind of makes me think about bell hoots and about being um, kind of open about sometimes the vulnerability we have as learners or the risks and the vulnerability we have as teachers. This is new to us, this online context. And I think if you feel comfortable, it can be quite powerful to be open about that with your students. But some of the best practice I've seen is colleagues who are using student response systems um, in our institution. We use Mentimeter. Some of you might also use um, technologies like Kahoot. And student um, staff are using Mentimeter asynchronously. They're embedding links to Mentimeter within our virtual learning environment and they're asking students how are they finding this blended context. Students can participate anonymously and it can allow us to look at um, how are students experiencing this? How are they making meaning of the learning? Um, does their interpretation of a task align with our intentions as the, the tutor? So there's some great examples of practice in seeking that student voice and being responsive to that. It doesn't mean you have to change what you're doing necessarily, but it can mean thinking about how you're articulating that and working with your students to reach a shared understanding and meaning. And I've said in this slide to be iterative. In this context, I would say try things. If you get student feedback that maybe they're not working in the way they intended, I'd maybe take an iterative approach and try different things. Different strategies will work with different groups. I think it's also important um, that we don't privilege certain forms of engagement. Our students are joining us from really difficult circumstances, um, but also we know some students, um, when they join online sessions, lots of teachers say, I want my students on the microphone, I want my students on the camera. What if you have a student that just wants to take their time and bring their thoughts together and articulate these in a chat comment or articulate these on a forum post? That form of engagement should be of equal parity and valued equally to the, to, to the contributions that are made on the microphone. And if we don't hear from our students, if we're in week five or six and we become conscious that actually there's a student who isn't actively participating in live sessions in, in the asynchronous virtual learning environment, I can't see their participation either. You might actually see from the 
learning analytics that they're not even they don't even have a digital footprint on your virtual learning environment i would proactively reach out so don't just say to my students get in touch with any issues reach out to them ask them ask them how they are finding this you might find that there's a student requiring additional support and i think this I've pointed to coherence, I've pointed to connection, and I hope you can see that the ethos of care is very much underpinning much of what I've said today. And this is just the sort of final slide to finish up. Um, care for both staff and students is absolutely fundamental in this context. Again, as, a, as an educator, I'm quite explicit in discussing this with my students, discussing ways in which we can um, be respectful, build a respectful learning community. Rather than doing this through rules and expectation setting, I like to explore this with my students and reach shared understandings. But I just wanted to signpost this quote to finish off by Stommel, Friend and Morris, that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has abruptly shifted more than one million students to fully online or remote instruction. And what has become immediately clear is that students face far more than technological hurdles. Student engagement is always a challenge in blended learning contexts. We need to think really carefully about it. But the context of COVID is adding an additional dimension and care and well-being need to be absolutely fundamental um, in our role as educators. <laughs>